together. We will. Mi Is that me walking that squeaks? I'm getting old. Ah, right. well, anyway. It is wonderful to worship with you this morning, and I know that there are a number of announcements that need to be shared. Um, we'll begin with our announcements, though, just by uh, reminding you that, and I'm going to let Brett remind you about the thing this afternoon, but on Tuesday we have the, um, the Good Neighbors are going to Epworth. We want to leave here at 9 a.m., so be here before 9, if at all possible. We're going to have a great time. We're going to Columbia for the Epworth Children's Home. Now, as a part of that, Libby wants to go. Well, Libby can go if Libby wants to go. So somebody else will be here in the office, but just whenever you call and you hear a different voice, that's why. So uh, that is Tuesday. We are going to... Um, Epworth's Children's Home. I would also just call to your attention that the we are starting a Bible study. That's in your bulletin as well. The study is called Living Fully, Dying Well. It's written by Bishop Reuben Job. The, some of the topics are listed there. It's, it's quite interesting, and, and really it's not as morbid as it might sound from the beginning. But um, there are books that are up here. I think there are some books out there in the narthex. And if you would like to register for this, please either call or email Libby, or you can just write it on a piece of paper and stick it in the offering today, and we'll get it all straight this week. Um, but... There are some books here and some out there, and we'd like for you to have those available. Um, nursery volunteers are needed. An email about that went out, but there's more information here if you would like to know about that. Brett, share. Thank you. Yes. Yes.
you. Um, <clears throat> I was also asked to just remind everybody that if you are planning to go to Salkahatchee this summer, to please contact Harold McMillan this week. Other announcements? Yes, Vicki. It's time for the Rhonda? Good. Okay. Any any other announcements? Yes, where? Me. Oh, me, up here. Um, if you were not here last Sunday, um, bring your um, offering to the ark um, this next church, or um, <coughs> I think you saw the box out there. Uh, I did. You can leave it out there. Or you can bring it next week if you don't feel comfortable. Good. All right. Any others? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Me. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Am I the right? Okay. Linda is correct. In fact, there's two of you I need to write down. We're going to do a Darkness to Light Wednesday night. If you would like to participate in that, um, please let me know. And you don't have to raise your hands or anything, but you can let me know or call and let Libby know in the morning. Any other announcements? having so much fun. Let us worship the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, you have indeed plunged us to victory beneath the cleansing flood. And we praise you every single day and pray that you will come into our lives and shape us into the people that you have created us to be. Oh God, bless this gathering, bless these friends, bless these hearts, that we might see your face. In the name of Christ, amen. So let us rise to sing Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. That's so fun. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah, and Christ has risen. Both of these are in the faith we sing.
Amen. Let us then with one heart and one voice affirm that which we believe in the historic words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us then be seated, and we'll invite the children to come for a special time with Miss Patty Barfield. Up oh, with Miss, Miss Mary Fites. Hey, Zach. And if you will bring your um, prayer request. you came today. I'm glad all of you came today. You know, I thought we would start today um, with a game. Is that okay? Is it called baseball? Okay, well, this game, <laughs> you did you? Well, this game is not baseball. We're going to play a game that's called I Doubt That. Do you know what doubt means? What does it mean? It means all right, good answer. Um, I doubt that you won't be a girl today. Oh, okay. All right, well, we're going to play that game, and, what, and this is how it's going to work. I'm going to tell you three things about me. Two of them will be true, and one of them won't be true. <coughs> okay, so it's up to you to decide which is which. Okay, let's start the game. Okay, let's go. And I'm going to tell you first what the three are so you can kind of be thinking about it to know which one you want to say is false. 
All right, so number one, I taught Sunday school for 28 years. Number two is my favorite color is green. Number three is a long time ago, I played the role of Annie on the Broadway stage. All right, now, if you think that I taught Sunday school for 28 years, raise your hand or say, I doubt that. You doubt that. <laughs> okay, you've got the game. All right, my favorite color is green. How many of you think my favorite color is green? Oh my, looks like unanimous on that. <laughs> and the third one is, a long time ago, I played the role of Annie on the Broadway stage. I doubt that. Oh my goodness, I think it's unanimous. I doubt Well, you're right. <laughs> Okay, you know, one of Jesus' disciples became very famous for doubting something that was really true. And do you know his name? Do any of you know? Thomas. Thomas. Yes, Thomas was the disciple. Uh, I have a good one. All right, well, let's, um, let's find out how that came about. After Jesus died on the cross, and then, remember, on Easter Sunday, he arose from the dead? Well, some of his disciples didn't see him rise. They didn't see him go. They were only told by an angel or um, uh, Mary who, um, who told them about it. Pardon me? Mm -hmm. So anyway... Um, after Jesus, uh, after all this happened to Jesus, he was, um, his disciples met in a room uh, in one of the houses. Well, actually, they were kind of hiding out. Now, why might they be hiding out after Jesus was crucified? I don't know. You don't? Oh, okay. What do you think? Okay. S Samantha? Okay, remember they, um, they were probably afraid, afraid that the people who crucified Jesus might come after them because he was one of Jesus' friends. They were all Jesus' friends, weren't they? So they were probably afraid. Mm -hmm. I heard that my, my friends told me that, that he only um, kills um, old people because he doesn't have any friends. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, while these uh, disciples were in the house, uh, all of a sudden, Jesus was there with them. And he said, peace be with you. And then he said he was going to send them out to tell all of the world about the kingdom of God. And that he would not send them out alone. He would send the Holy Spirit with them to give them guidance, to give them comfort, to give them strength. And so, um, and then just as quickly as he came, Jesus was gone. And then, you, they were so happy, the, dis the disciples and all of the people were so happy in that room because they knew Jesus was alive. They knew he was alive. And so, they just, they were so happy. And then, um, Thomas was not with them the first time Jesus came. And they couldn't wait for Thomas to get back to the house so they could tell him that Jesus was actually there in the same room with them. So uh, a few days later, they were in this room again, and Jesus appeared to them again. He came into the room, and he said, Peace be with you. And then... Um, well, let's go back a little bit. Um, uh, when, when Thomas came to the house, they told him that Jesus was alive. And you know what he said? What? He said, unless I see the nail prints in his hand, and in, unless I can put my hand in his side, I will not believe that. Mm. So when Jesus came the second time to see them,
who was there. And he said, and Thomas said, Thomas believed right away, and he said, my Lord and my God. And he was so happy. And Jesus said, have you believed because you have seen? He said, blessed are those who believe who have not seen. And that would be all of us. We have not seen Jesus, have we? But we believe him, don't we? We believe in him. We believe he died. Good, I'm glad you do. All right, shall we pray? Dear God, thank you for blessing us with faith in Jesus. Can you repeat after me? And thank you for giving us your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you for coming today. Peace be with you. Hey there. As the children are, I take it they're going with you, Vicki. All right, as the children are going with Vicki, those that have permission to go to Children's Chapel, let us, the rest of us, prepare our hearts by singing together more like you. And so let us lift before the Lord, Kevin Richburg, people with cancer, Hannah and family, the family of Dawson Bourne, Hannah Warren, Abby and Mark, Saunders, Hannah Warren, the Smith family, the Sheely family, Joe and Sally Latore, Louise McMillan, Teresa Lee, the family of Walter Scott, Kathy Ross, Hannah Warren, Francis Bledsoe, Pat and Rex Connor, their family, the family of Bill Harris, Gwinnett, our church, our youth, and our country, Rex and Pat Connor, Gary and Linda Sheely, relationships, Hannah and family, the Power family, Katie Cooter and family, Steve Duncan, Pat and Joe Spell, Pam Westbury, Philip and Mary Westbury, Kimberly Duke, Walter Scott family, police officers everywhere, and the family of Mr. Slager, Jackie Ratledge and family, Cody, Zachary, Samantha, and George, 
and Sergio Welts. Jamie Seichardt and family, the family of Harriet Collins, our college students, Hannah, Stephen, Julia, Elizabeth, Jesse, Kayla, Lachlan, Tori, Jan, and their medical teams and families. Steve and Kitty Duncan, the Cooter family, the Power family, Betty Fincher, and Reverend Norman Knight. And there are so many more. Let us pray. O oh God, where two or three are gathered, you have said you are present. And we feel you here with us this day, giving us hope, giving us courage, and giving to us forgiveness. For we have sinned mightily. Lord, sometimes our sins have been selfish, and sometimes we have sinned out of fear. And we pray that you will lead us in the right way. We pray too for these our brothers and sisters that we have named and for those we've not named. We pray for situations in our community and in this city and in your world. We pray that there would be a spirit of peace and a spirit of calm and a spirit of hope that would imbue all of this city. And we pray that we, who know Jesus Christ, would have the courage to be his presence in the world. Lord, we pray for mercy for all who suffer. We pray for healing, and we pray for hope. For this is truly a broken and hurting world. We pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to worship the Lord our God with the giving of his tithes and our offerings.
Let us continue to praise with the singing of Breathe On Me, Breath of God, number 420. Amen. Please be seated as Jim comes forward to share with us this day from the Gospel of John. Well, it's Lisa. Okay. Well, we had a good job this week, didn't we? Come on, Lisa. Would you pray with me? The prayer of elimination is found in our bulletin. Lord, open our minds by the power of your Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with transforming joy what you say to us today. Amen. And the scripture today is John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. In 
Isn't it wonderful how, it, how in there John includes an explanation? These things are written down so that you may hear them and believe. These things are written down so that you may have eternal life. <sighs> it's good when things are so clear. So as we consider this text that Lisa read so beautifully... We begin by wondering for ourselves, what does church look like for you? What does church look like to you? Now, some of you are immediately going to think or say, St. Mark. And here we are in St. Mark, and this looks like church. Some of you are going to say, well, a church has a high ceiling. You know, I went in a church one time that was about this big but had a low ceiling. It felt kind of strange, but it was church. You might say that church is, has stained glass windows. And these are beautiful, and they tell us the story of Jesus. But if you'll go over to St. Andrew's Parish, United Methodist, they have a clear window right back there, and they see crows flying around during worship. It just adds to it. I guess. Um, you might say that at a church, a church has a steeple. We have a beautiful steeple right out here. We have bells in the steeple or something like it. The church where I grew up had a dome, not a steeple, but it was church. You might, when somebody says, what does church look like? You might be thinking about the beautiful carpet. The beautiful new carpet we are standing upon. And the beautiful choir area where they have hardwood stuff. It's beautiful. And friends, we are going to take care of it. Because this, like the last, has to last us about 30 years. So be careful. Be mindful. When you think about church, you might think about the architecture. Or you might start singing. You might remember that wonderful old hymn, and I'm not going to sing. Don't get excited. No problem. But you might remember that wonderful old hymn that begins, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. You might remember that as United Methodist, we are connectional. Meaning that all United Methodist churches are part of the larger church. None of us stands alone. You might think about people. You might remember that thing that we all used to do. Where we folded our fingers like this. And we closed them up and we said, here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the door and see all the people. You might. And if you really want to show off whenever you do that, you say, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door and see the ecclesia. That's the old Greek word for congregation, for the people, for the church. The ecclesia. And, and, and for those of you that like big church words, that was special just for you. So what did the church, the Ecclesia, look like on that first Easter? On that first Easter, while it was still dark, on that morning, while it was still dark, Mary and some of the women went to the tomb and they found it empty, but Mary stayed and she recognized Jesus when he said her name. And she went back and she told the other disciples, I have seen the Lord. And it was Easter morning, and we have a great time on Easter. On Easter, we smile and sing Alleluia. On Easter, we have Easter bonnets. On Easter, we eat chocolate bunny ears. On Easter, we have a great time. But on that first Easter Sunday morning, she said, I have seen the Lord. And they said, that's great, lock the door. Shh, be quiet. Shh. They were all huddled in that room on that first Easter. They were all in a room behind locked doors out of fear of the Jews. Turn the lights off. Shh. You know, whenever you're in hiding, you keep the lights way down low and you try to be quiet. It gets warm and stuffy because there's no airflow. They didn't have air conditioning back then. They had no fresh air at all. 
And if they did light a lamp, it just added to the stuffiness of the room and you get the smell of burning oil. And on top of that, you got the smell of a warm room with unwashed bodies. And the smell of fear, the smell of anxiety. On that first Easter, they didn't look or smell like we do today. Even so, Jesus came to them. In the flesh of his resurrection, Jesus came. He had a real body, real skin. But somehow he managed to come in through passing through the wall or the locked door or whatever. He was just there with them. And we cannot explain it. And maybe the how of him appearing there with them is part of that wonderful holy mystery that God has not seen fit to explain to us. And we're just going to have to say, okay, remember this is God. And God does not have to explain God's self to humans. And if you think God, does, that's kind of arrogant, you know. But Jesus was there in the flesh in a frightened little church. And you know, there they were, trembling behind locked doors, listening fearfully for footsteps that would come and condemn them. And there was Jesus. And he did not reproach them with disappointment for having deserted him. He did not condemn them for their weakness and fear when he was being beaten and spat upon and mocked. He did not shame them for their cowardice or for their denial of him. He did not ask why they were behind locked doors. He said, peace be with you. He did not give them the anger and the reproach that we deserve. Rather, he gave them peace. Twice, he said, peace be with you. That's what they needed. And he breathed into them the power of the Holy Spirit. He gave them love. He gave them hope of forgiveness. And then he left them having blessed them and empowered them and equipping them for a life of faith. Now a solid week passes. It's the first Sunday after Easter. And Thomas is there with the disciples. Now most of us have grown up thinking Thomas. Dirty, stinker, doubting Thomas. But you know... He might not be such a bad guy. I mean, you think about it. On that first Easter, after Mary has come and said, I have seen the Lord, they locked the door. But Thomas is the only one who's either crazy enough or faithful enough, whichever way you want to go about it, to be out there in the world. And a week later... They have seen the risen Lord, and they're happy about it, I'm sure, but they're still huddled up in that little room. Mary has said, I've seen the Lord. Jesus has showed up among them, and they're still in that little room. They aren't living as Easter people. They've locked the doors. So they tell Thomas, we've seen the Lord, and Thomas says, I need to see proof. And then Jesus is with them. And Jesus invites Thomas to see. He doesn't reproach Thomas. He doesn't say, Thomas, you stink. He doesn't say, Thomas, why not? He doesn't fuss. He invites Thomas to faith. Come and see. Thomas responds with the briefest confession of faith ever. He says, my Lord and my God. Now, my Lord isn't that new. Not so much. They've been following Jesus as their leader for years, but... Then Thomas goes and he adds, my God. That's Thomas saying, you are God to Jesus. That is full recognition. And we could go on until it's time to go play ball this afternoon about all of the Christological implications about being fully human and fully divine. We could talk about the word being made flesh. We could marvel 
And this is, we could marvel that Jesus still comes and stands among the disciples today and shows love by op opening a way for people to believe. Jesus still does that, comes to where people are and makes a way for them to believe. Then Jesus says, blessed are those who believe without seeing. And as Mary said so beautifully, uh, in that case, he's speaking to me and you. Jesus delivered a blessing to you and me personally that day. For we have not seen Jesus in the flesh with his hands and his side pierced. But yet we have believed and he declared us blessed 2,000 years ago. Today we don't see his body. But the power of the Holy Spirit is with us, in us. And by that, we have his peace, his hope, his love. We know forgiveness. So I ask you again, what does church look like? And I saw a neat little church in Romania. It's a lovely little church made out of ice. It's about 6,600 feet up in the mountains in, in Romania. You have to take a cable car to get to this church. And, and water from Balea Lake, which is about 190 miles northwest of Bucharest, is blessed by the priest. And then they cut that, when it freezes and all, they cut it into squares with chainsaws. And then they haul it up there by that cable car. And then they take snow and stuff and they build it into a church. And the church is about 20 feet tall. It's about 46 feet long and about 23 feet wide. Would it fit in this room? This morning at 9 o'clock they said it would. I don't know. Y'all measure. <laughs> it's created and it is used by Catholic by Orthodox and by Protestant congregations for worship and baptisms and weddings until the ice melts. And it's beginning to be spring, so the ice is melting and the church is melting. Down in the valley, there are regular churches like this one. And there are tensions among all the different denominations and groups. But in the ice church, they worship together. And that sounds rather holy to me. A geographical place called church, where people put aside their differences to worship the one God. A place where all kinds of people come together to share one another's burdens, to celebrate one another's jo joys, to carry one another's hard times and to love one another and to laugh together when things are good. It sounds heavenly. You know, I, I've always heard that certain denominations are going to be kind of surprised when they get to heaven and look around and say, ooh, they let those in here. Some of us going to get to heaven and people going to see us and they're going to say, ooh, they let you in here. <laughs> hey, Jesus Christ came down here because God loves us. Gave his life for us. And there's no denominations in heaven. And in that ice church, there's God's people all together. But the cool thing about the ice church, and no pun intended with that, the cool thing about the ice church is that it does melt. And it goes back into the world. And church, that's what we are called to do, to melt back into the world, to take our holy experience of Jesus Christ from this place out there, because there's a world out there that needs to know of God's love. There's a world out there that needs to know that by the gracious gift of Jesus Christ upon a cross that we are forgiven. There is a world out there that is hurting and needs to know of Jesus. That's what we are called to do, to take our experience of Christ here and give it to the world. 
When Jesus empowered and equipped the disciples with his Holy Spirit, it wasn't so they could stay in that room, but so that they could go out and take the love and the peace and the hope and the forgiveness that are only available through Jesus Christ out to the world. Salvation is not to be our little secret. It is a gift of God to the whole world. And we, the church, are commissioned to be the hands and the feet and the hearts and the mouths of God to take that to the world. I take that seriously. And I hope you do too. So yes, yesterday I stood in the rain. I stood in the rain in North Charleston yesterday and prayed for hope and peace in a community that is not mine. But with and for my brothers and sisters in Christ, for the love of God is not bound by geography, by race, or by the state of any one person's soul. The word of God is to be out there. And so we prayed for all of God's people. And we gathered in hope. Today we will gather over in the playground, or on playground, and we'll play ball. And we do this to carry God's love into the world. Because after the game today, when we've had a great time, we've laughed a lot. I might hit the ball, we don't know. But afterward, whatever funds we raise will be used to buy nets, to protect children and protect their families, to give them a chance in the world, to give them hope in Christ. You see, friends, whenever we leave this place, we do not cease to be the church, but we go forth to be the church in a world that hurts, in a world that struggles to believe that there is any good in anybody. We leave this place to be the church in a world that would rather be angry than listen, in a world that actually finds hate. To be comfortable. Will you go forth then to be the church? Will you take Jesus into the world when you go out the door today? Or will you be leaving Jesus here until next Sunday? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so let us sing and pray together. Lord, speak to me, number 463.
So let us go then from this place to be the church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.